The story of you filling up your gas tank angrily because it was 15 cents per gallon less last week, but you still had half a tank then, begins millions of years ago. Back then, there was a lot of marine life, mainly algae and some microscopic organisms that died and settled on the ocean floor. These became fossils, and many, many years later, the fossils mixed with mud and sand with sediment piling on top, turning the organic material into a dark, waxy substance called kerogen. As more and more sediment piles on top, the kerogen gets pushed harder into the ground. The extreme pressure and heat generated from this process breaks up the kerogen molecules, turning them into shorter and lighter molecules composed almost entirely of carbon and hydrogen. Depending on how liquid or gaseous the kerogen was, the process turns the kerogen into oil or natural gas. Different amounts get pushed into pockets deep in the earth called reservoirs. So what's to stop you from burying some organic material in your backyard and waiting for it to heat up and turn into crude oil to get rich quick? Well, although the exact amount of time is unknown, it's estimated that it takes at least somewhere in the hundreds of thousands to millions of years to create the crude oil that is used today. Geologists working for oil companies identify locations that would be likely to contain oil deposits underground, but estimating how much oil is underground and finding exactly where it's at can be a little tricky. Luckily, there are ways around it. Surveyors looking for oil use a vibrating truck. It sends vibrations into the earth below it, while a large array of geophones, which convert ground movement into voltage, are measuring the response. These geophones record the data and, based on differing amounts of readings, the geophones in different locations receive can tell what kind of material is below. These days, they've actually gotten so good at making these maps that they can now make a 3D model that shows multiple levels of rock below it. A team of geologists examines the data, and they can usually gather a lot of information from the data including the porousness of the rock around the oil, the size of the reservoir, and the degree to which the reservoir is saturated with water. After coming to a conclusion, they have to present their estimations and defend their reasoning. Once they have located the oil, they begin to drill for it. This can get pretty dangerous because gas pockets easily explode, and oil spills can be devastating to the environment. So how do they extract the crude oil from the ground? So as they are drilling into the ground, they actually pump a thick fluid comprised of gas, water, or some sort of aerated mud depending on where they're drilling and what kind of rock they're drilling through. This helps them maintain pressure to prevent rapid decompression of the oil well. It also helps them collect debris as they drill and bring it up to the surface. All this oil they manage to pull out of the ground is in the crude state. This can't be used in anything in the state that it's in. It needs to be refined first. Depending on where it gets extracted from the earth, it may be transported to refineries via pipelines, trains, ships, or semi-trucks. At the refinery, the crude oil gets heated until it turns into a gas. The gas rises and begins to cool and condense back into a liquid which separates it into layers. This occurs many times. The bottom layer is a heavy gas oil, then above that sits the lubricating oil, then kerosene, and gasoline on top. However, these are all still touching, so it has to go through a little more processing to separate the gas from the other types of oil. Then we have the gasoline we use in our cars today. So, I mentioned that the gas comes out of the refinery. It was the top layer, but there are different kinds of gas. You see them at the pumps, even though you've probably always bought the same kind since you started driving. So what is different about the different kinds of gas? And which kind should you really be using? So the gas that I referred to earlier was the base gas that comes out of a refinery. But that's actually not the final step in making gasoline. After it's refined, Workers add additives to the gas in accordance with the mandates of the Environmental Protection Agency, also known as the EPA, in order to clean a car's engine and reduce emissions. Then, different companies put in their own additives to further promote cleaning and performance in the engine. They do this to serve as a competitive advantage over other companies. Getting to the specifics, the majority of cars today use 87 octane gas. This gas works well for most cars and is the cheapest. 
If you use a higher performance car, you may be recommended or required to use a higher octane rating, like 90 or more. This has to do with something called knocking. Normally, in a combustion engine, there is a chamber that fills with air and fuel, and then a spark makes it ignite. However, with knocking, the combustion chamber fills with air and gas and self-combusts before the spark is fired. This happens because there is a lot of heat and pressure in the engine that allows the self-combustion. Knocking can hurt the performance of the car and actually damages your engine over time. The higher octane fuels are able to endure more compression and heat, so they are more resistant to knocking. The next kind of fuel you may have seen is E85 gas. This fuel is a mixture of gas and ethanol, which comes from corn. Since ethanol has less chemical energy than regular gasoline, it burns cleaner and also comes from a more sustainable resource, corn. It's also subsidized by the government, which makes it cheaper than other forms of fuel. So E85 is actually only 15% gasoline and 85% ethanol. This may sound like a pretty good deal, but it does have its caveats. Since ethanol has less chemical energy, you're going to get fewer miles per gallon than the regular 87 octane. In some areas, you can get other ratios of ethanol to gasoline, but these are the ones you see most often. And most cars use gas with ethanol, so if you want to save some money and do a little bit less damage to the environment, consider switching. But before you do, and this is very, very important, do your own research with your particular car to make sure it can use ethanol before you put anything new into your tank. Look up your car online or check the owner's manual. I don't want you losing an engine from watching a YouTube video. As a little bonus, I'll talk about diesel fuel. It has a lot more chemical energy than gasoline. This causes diesel engines to be more fuel efficient. Most of the time, you'll find it used in pickup trucks and semis. This increase in chemical energy makes them ideal for heavier loads. But once again, I'm going to emphasize, don't try and switch diesel with other fuel if your car takes regular gas. It will destroy your engine. So what's causing the price at the pump to fluctuate so much? There are many factors, but most can be narrowed down to simply three things. Supply, demand, and operations. Supplies of crude oil vary worldwide, as various suppliers, namely OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, decide how much oil to release into the market. OPEC was founded in 1960, initially with five countries, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Venezuela. It has now grown to 13 countries. They hold a large percent of the world's supply of oil and claim to have formed in order to ensure a steady supply of oil for the world by regulating how much is pushed out into the market at a given time. While they have managed to accomplish this and continue to sell oil at the internally agreed upon rate, they are also accused of abusing their power in the industry to keep oil prices artificially higher. After all, the members of OPEC are collaborating to make sure that the countries in the organization are making money on their oil while avoiding any regulation in the industry. The demand of oil is also constantly fluctuating as needs are constantly shifting. Taking retail gasoline sales for example, gas prices tend to be the highest in the summer and in the fall as that is when most people are on the road. Gas prices are at their lowest in the winter when people are more likely to avoid driving unnecessarily. Finally, operations can impact price, whether it's the refineries needing more time to produce gasoline from the crude oil or, as more recent events have shown, transportation of oil and distribution change can greatly impact the price. This can be seen as recently as May 7, 2021, when the Colonial Pipeline was hacked, restricting the flow along the east coast of the United States. The pipeline served approximately 50% of the gas to the east coast. The gas reserves stored on either side of the pipeline were the only thing that prevented mass shortages in fuel, but they weren't able to prevent a temporary spike in price at the pump. So the next time you're filling up at the pump, consider the complexities of both the natural processes and the human supply chain that has taken the gas from the reservoir to your gas tank. Then consider switching to an electric vehicle, at least when they aren't so dang expensive. 
Thank you for watching Learn Something New. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider liking and subscribing. It really does mean a lot. I'm a new YouTuber and want to make the best content possible for you all. So if you have comments about the videos, things that you thought worked well or things that you disliked, let me know in the comments section so I can improve my videos. Thanks again.